My name is William Cook, and I'm here from the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm here to talk about ENSO, which is a project I've been working on for, oh, about 10 years on and off to uh, be a, a new style of programming. And so let me try and just talk about what, uh, well, unfortunately, my uh, thing crashed right before I started. And um, seems to have lost some pictures. Um, Well, that's unfortunate. Um, well, I guess we'll just go in without them. Um, what there should be in there is just a picture of a person who is uh, getting requirements, which describe what a system does, and doing the normal thing of looking at the requirements, analyzing the, the, co the, uh, the problem, writing code, writing lots of code, and then you can run the code and get some behavior. And so um, that's sort of the typical approach to developing software. Now, um, one thing that I think of is that um, what, what typically happens is that there's a separate activity, which is coming up with a strategy for how you're going to go about implementing the system. And um, so strategies don't come from requirements per se, but they're, they're influenced by them. And um, the... Uh, Are we good? No? Oh. The, um, but, but it is important that developers, these people who are missing here, do typically come up with a, a sort of strategy for how they're going to go about coming up with, with the particular implementation, how they're going to go about writing their code. When they do these strategy, one thing that happens is that the strategy becomes kind of a pervasive element of the programmer's head. And what it does, it, it influences all the code that's being generated right? pervasively. And so it's, it's, you can think of it as an aspect. The strategy is like an aspect that, that covers everything about the code and um, influences it, but is nowhere explicit, right? The strategy is, itself is not written down anywhere. Typically, it's just in their head. And what gets written down is the consequences of the strategy, the decisions that, that, that get made from the strategy, how, we're, how are we going to go about doing stuff, looking at the requirements, what we need to do, we generate lots of code. So um, this next slide here is... Um, to try and reify this and, and make something explicit that, that's implicit. So if you think about it, um, we have this requirements what, input, vague kind of thing. Strategy is this vague thing that the programmer gets in their head. And um, what I want to do is, is flip it around to make those be real things. So um, now there's someone over here where those arrows go, a person that you can't see, and another person here with the red arrow. And they're getting the requirements, but I'm envisioning the strategies actually being written down as actual flexible strategies. Okay, they're not 
not the code that comes from the strategy, but the strategy itself, written down in some generic way. And so the, um, the part that is um, the requirements, that is the, the details that are specific to the particular application, that are, that are specific to that, are written down in a model in this view. Now, the model itself might contain um, description of structure, behavior, it might have code in it as well. So I'm using the model in a very generic, kind of um, loose way. Don't think UML. Think you model in a, in a uh, much broader sense. And the idea being that um, the model represents sort of the specifics of the application. The strategy is the specifics of how to make that application work. And then the strategy implementing the model, the model is, is given as an input to the strategy, actually. And then that will generate the behavior. And so this is a, um, I guess, a, a fairly radical way of looking at software. If you could do this, it would be interesting. Um, at the same time, there, there are people who have been saying that we should do this for a while. So um, anyway, let me, let me tell you about my experience trying to do this. Um, here's an example. So um, if you want to implement some data structures, one way to do it would be to um, create a data model that represented what you wanted your data to have, its properties. And um, that would be the data requirements could go into this data model. It would look like, now you could, you could do it in a lot of different ways. It could look like a type system. It could look like an entity relationship diagram. It could look like um, a relational model. Right? There's lots of different ways to represent data models. And the key thing here is that one thing that would be interesting is to, is to allow you to represent not just the structure of the data, but also its constraints. What if you wanted to, to represent the properties that the model needs to satisfy. So those could also be represented as conditions, constraints put into that data model. A data manager is now a strategy for how to implement that particular kind of data model. Now, you might have different kinds of data managers. There's relational data managers that run relational databases. There's you know, um, UML data managers that can run UML-style data models. There are uh, lots of different kinds of data models. You, you can just use C++ if you want um, to have a, an OO kind of data model. And then what you get out of it is objects that implement some particular uh, behavior. So that's the idea. To be precise, um, we have a paper on this called Managed Data, which, which describes a way to do this, one way to do this in Haskell, I mean, in, in, uh, not in Haskell, in Ruby. And um, the idea is that you implement, you describe the structure of the data using, well, some data, actually. And uh, in this case, it's point equals, and this is really just a, um, a, a hash record in Ruby. It has, it has an X field of type integer and a Y field of type integer. That's just a, that's just a data object in Ruby. Um, but it happens to look like a data type. It has all the information you need to, to create a data type. And so we could actually write a thing called basic record, which is an example of one of these data model managers. And it would have a new property, or a new method that allows you to create a new instance, passing it a description in this style. And then it would create uh, a P, which is a point that has an X and a Y. And if you say P.Z, you should get an error. So the idea here is that we have um, created um, cla what, what look like classes dynamically by programming data and using data to describe data. Um, so one thing that requires is that you override the dot operator. Actually, actually, there is no method. There is no method in here. X p dot x and p dot y. Those 
don't exist as methods necessarily. But in, in a lot of languages, you can override the dot operator. Um, and you can do it in Ruby using method missing, missing, method missing in Smalltalk using does not understand. High dispatch, Python, Lua, CLOS, um, define method. There are lots of different ways to do this in dynamic languages. And so that's a, a cool idea. Um, OK, so the other thing that's interesting about it is besides simple behavior, you can have other kinds of behaviors associated with your managed object. What other things do you want to put in there? Well, you could have mutability. Maybe you could have non-mutability. Um, observa observations so that um, when something changes, it, it posts observations automatically. You can put constraints on it. Um, security checks based on current user. Um, you can have graphs, persistence. All these different facets now could be built into that data manager and um, you can choose what kind of features you want your data to have and do that in a kind of a pervasive way across all your data as opposed to having to program it up individually in each, uh, in each case. Because it's a general strategy that applies to all accesses and updates. And it, um, you can combine them together. If you do this right, you can um, combine these different features and have it be essentially a uh, kind of a menu. I want to have a secure uh, graph-based observable data structure. And then you get that. OK, so one other thing I want to point out is that this, this I've been talking about one data manager here, one, one kind of model, a data model, one kind of manager. But um, sometimes there are multiple different DSLs involved. And what we have is a, a kind of a chocolate chip cookie model right now, where there's little bits of DSLs get used in very specific places in a, in a large application, where the, most of the application is written, glued together with some general purpose code like Java. So um, this is familiar. You could see that DSLs would be SQL, maybe a relational data model, maybe a grammar. Things like that are examples of DSLs. Um, what I'm proposing is to uh, invert this and try and cover the space with DSLs and then fill in places where you need some specific behavior using general purpose code. So imagine having your application so that the, the DSLs were smart enough that they actually could talk to each other as opposed to having to talk to some glue code. And uh, if you could do that, then you'd get something more like a blueberry pie with uh, four or five DSLs embedded with um, specific GPL code. And this is a little bit more like what you might see in JavaScript inside of GPL, you know, general purpose code inside of um, HTML. OK. So. I mentioned other kinds of DSLs. Um, grammars are another one. Besides data models, we have grammars. Grammars are very interesting. Um, they're a mapping between text and an object graph is, a, is, a, is one way that, to look at them. Um, we have a notion of uh, object grammars. And um, they are allowed to create graphs, not just trees. So it's, it's interesting how to do that. Um, here's an example of a point, which would be written open paren x comma y, close paren, where x and y are integers. Um, so the, the, the grammar notation for doing that in our system has some, uh, has some more stuff in it. The, uh, in addition to Here's the grammar rule here. Can you see that? No. I guess you can't. Yeah. So here's the grammar rule. Um, it says that it's going to create a point, and it matches 
left open paren, it's going to set x, the x field of this point, to an integer. And it's going to match a comma, set the y field of the point to an integer, and then match uh, a closed paren. So it's actually doing more work than uh, a normal grammar would do because it has these fields, for example. And the point constructor is, is explicit here. So we're, we're, we're integrating the creation of the object with the uh, syntax of the, of the grammar. And actually, this allows it to be bidirectional as well, so that you could say, to print a point, this says, to print a point, print out the x field as an integer, a comma, then the y field as an integer, and then a colon, or a close paren. Or you can read something in that way and create a point. So it's, it's nice that way. Yeah? Uh, so um, we have um, an integer literal as a fixed built-in type. But uh, you could certainly extend it with other specific types. Um, so it's bidirectional. It can parse and pretty print. And it's a GLL parsing, and it's interpreted. So one thing that's interesting about it is we don't do parser generator as well. We don't do code generation in general. We just interpret the models directly. So it interprets the, uh, the grammar on the fly. Um, so here's a couple of larger examples with um, all the pieces involved. So this is an expression grammar. It's got uh, a grammar here that says it's got um, a left and a right um, as M's. Well, an E, I guess this is a uh, It's a left recursive rule, so it can have any number of, of e's to the left. Um, and then a right m, or just a plain m. And then m is a, a multiply rule, which is a left m, and a right p. And a p is an uh, integer or a parenthesized expression. So that's a, a grammar that will parse or print out um, an expression. And um, there's a schema that I didn't talk about very much, but it's a, it's a DSL for describing data structures, schema language. And it happens to be um, class-based has a class expression, class num, class add, class mull, left and right expressions. Um, these should all be expressions. So I'll fix that. Let's see if I can do it. Um, I've got some serious uh, great. Um, so these are expressions, and then there's an interpreter that interprets them in the middle here. And uh, it says how to evaluate a value, how to evaluate an add, how to evaluate a mull. And then we can obviously type in an expression and get it to evaluate. Serious water coming in. All right. Um, here's a state machine grammar. Um, 
start state, list of states. State has a name and a set of transitions. Transition has an on, an event. Go to a new state. So here's an actual state machine. Here's the uh, schema for a state machine. This is actually a state machine over here. Um, this is the way it's written. Start state is opened. On close, go to closed. On close, it can go back to open or locked. Locked goes back to closed when you unlock it. And then there's a um, simple interpreter here that can interpret a state machine. So we read in a state machine into the schema. It has um, a name, output transitions, input transitions. So it's a, it's a fairly nice data model for, for transitions and state machines. And then we can run one. Basically, while we get S, um, prints the current name of the state, input is uh, the current line, looks for an output, an input that has that transition. If it finds it, it sets the current to that transition too. So it's a fairly simple approach. Um, I don't want to go through this too much, but I do want to mention that um, this is our grammar of grammars. So grammars are describable as grammars, obviously. Um, and uh, they have rules, they have alternatives, they have sequences, field names, references, call, code. Um, and uh, so just so we know that we can do that. And then this is, um, this is an interesting picture. It, it shows the relationship between these four key schemas at the very top of our system. So there's a schema schema, which describes the structure of data. Okay, so this is the schema schema. It's, it describes how to describe data. And since it's data, it describes itself. Um, down here, there's a grammar grammar that describes how to describe grammars. And the grammar grammar, um, now we have, we have a grammar schema. That's the schema of how to represent grammars. Okay. And that's an instance of the schema schema. And it um, has, as one of its instances, the grammar grammar. And then we also have a schema grammar, which is a grammar for how to describe schemas. And so it is um, formatted by, well, the schema schema is formatted by the schema grammar. And um, the schema grammar is formatted by the grammar grammar. And the uh, schema grammar is formatted by the schema grammar. So these kind of fundamental four schemas um, are kind of the root of the system. And um, they get things going. And um, in particular, the schema schema has to be an instance of itself. And the grammar grammar has to be formatted by itself. So they, they actually tie themselves off as a loop. Um, OK. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about diagrams, which are um, a way to present information. So a diagram is a, is a model. It's, it's like a, think of it like a, a, draw, a draw document. It's, it's, it's got shapes. It's got things in it. Um, and uh, allows you to move things around, basically. So here's an example of a diagram. It happens to be a representation of a, a schema schema. It says that the schema has a list of types, which are, um, have a name. A type has two different subtypes, primitives and classes. Classes have a list of supertypes and defined fields, and a field 
has a name, whether it's optional, whether it's many-valued, whether it's a key, whether it's auto, whether it's traversal, and an inverse field, and a type, which sends it up to its type. So that's just a diagram. The interesting thing is that we can then um, define a stencil, which is a mapping between some high-level model and a diagram. So this is going to be a presentation of, well, the information in this diagram onto this diagram itself. So what that would look like is um, something like this. It's a model that's a mapping from an object graph onto a diagram. And it, um, in order to, to implement it, it's going to inherit the functionality of the diagram editor. It's going to map object graphs to diagrams and maps the changes back to the object graph. So the idea here is that this is actually bidirectional now. If you make a mapping between a, um, this is a, well, it's hard to show what a stencil looks like. I'll show a couple pictures of it in a minute. But this is a, a running application now that's a, a stencil that's taken the schema schema and mapped it onto diagram. Okay, so we have a mapping from schema schemas to diagrams. Now, if you change the diagram, like if you add, delete a field, it can change the corresponding item in the actual schema schema or add a field. So things like adding and removing menus, you don't need to specify that those really need to, um, well, there needs to be one bit that says, should this um, menu be created or not? Because, for example, down here, there's a field named field, and it has a list of its fields in it. Fortunately, it's kind of self-referential. Self but um, clicking on one of those fields and saying delete could correspond to deleting the corresponding object in the actual schema schema, or adding a new field, you could add it. So all you really need to know is the, whether or not the menu should be there. And in general, they should be. Um, and uh, so it's more than just, the, the, the binding is, is more than just based on the data, like the, the names. It's actually based on the structure as well. It's quite interesting. Here's an actual picture of, of a schema. Um, it says that to diagram a schema, make a graph, and then make a menu class for each class in the schema classes, label the class, make a box. So this is basically making a box with the width and the color, putting vertical text in it. Here it puts the class name. And then for each field, if the field type is primitive, output a horizontal row, which has the field name, a colon, and the field type name. So it's a fairly concise description of how to create this box here from a class. Now, it omits the, these, these fields that are out here, the deleted fields, and the type and the inverse. Those are not primitive values. So those get left out from the list of only the primitive, only things with primitive values, booleans and stirs, get included in the um, So um, the other thing I want to point out is that one of the big problems, going back to that original idea of how we do software now, where we have requirements and we come up with our strategy and we write a lot of code, the problem is that if a year after doing that, you look at your thing and you sit there and you go, oh my god, there were elements of my strategy that were wrong. I should have done it differently. You're pretty much hosed because you have very different code to write everywhere. 
because the strategy is different. And you basically just give up. You don't bother. So changes to strategies are very difficult after the system has been built. Whereas um, with this system that I'm envisioning, the strategies are actually implemented as a kind of meta program. And if you change them, then the system will behave differently. So um, here's a little bit more of the uh, stencils. This shows the, how the connectors are created. Um, for each class, in the schema classes, it goes through um, again and makes a menu parent for the super class. And it makes a connector between the uh, class and the super. So this is basically connecting the um, class to its super class, if it has a parent. Um, and also for relationships, I need that as well. OK. So the last thing I need to point out is that it's not just one data model. It's multiple data models. So when the requirements get read in, there's actually data, security, user interface, workflow, et cetera. Multiple different facets of the system need to be described. And then there need to be multiple strategies that coordinate to deal with all those different facets of the application to create the behavior. So it's really a, a multifaceted, multi-strategy um, setup. And in particular, some of these strategies can also be like aspects in the sense that they um, apply to other strategies. They actually, they actually are strategies that, apply, that, that modify other strategies. So for example, debugging is a, is a strategy that can apply to a general interpreter. You, you, you wrap the debugger around the interpreter, it, it will um, be able to hook into the right places when the debugging should occur, and also potentially um, show the right information um, based on the data that's in the strategy. So it's quite interesting. All right. So just want to point out um, there's an interesting language workbench challenge that we got involved with um, where they had a, a model. They had a challenge to try and create um, languages for, um, they have a, di a different challenge every year. And one year, they had a description of how to create a heating system. So we um, implemented some models for a physical heating system and a controller for a heating system and a simulator to run the heating system and a state machine to run the, the controller. What it looks like is this. So here was a, an example heating system implemented in our system. Oops, sorry. Um, and it's got a boiler and a return and a burner and a pump and a valve and a radiator, um, gas. And uh, you can see how hot things are. Um, and then there was a controller, which was a uh, state machine. And it was in radiator mode right now. But it was you know, able to go to, to cool down mode, running mode, boiler mode, ramp up, start. And uh, so it, it had conditions on it to determine when to start running and when to move. And then there were strategies for running these things, how to run these models. And um, yeah, so that was quite interesting. And um, so it all was asynchronous too, that the simulation was updating the models and the, the model was changing at real time and you could also interact with it and, and change the uh, state and change the uh, desired temperature in the, in the room, for example, and it would all work nicely. Um, okay, so ENSO is currently slow but usable. It's um, 
we're looking at using partial evaluation to improve its performance. Um, haven't really done that yet in full, but we've done some experiments. And um, my job is to give compiler people something to do, which is make something really slow and then give it to people who can make it really faster. Um, okay, so I'm running out of time, so I think I'm going to skip this. I just threw it in here in case I had needed an extra um, little discussion of trees versus um, graphs. And so it was based on tree graphs versus trees in general, which makes things a little more complicated. So in summary, ENSO is um, about executable specification languages. That's what modeling languages are. Things like data, grammar, GUI, web, security, queries, et cetera. You get enough of those, connect them together so that you don't really need glue code. They're implemented as external DSLs. They're not embedded. They're interpreted, not compiled. And um, composition of the interpreters is with language. They're, they're objects, so they just compose very nicely. And also, it's self-implemented, so, and so it's implemented in itself, um, which is using Ruby and JavaScript right now. Partial evaluation is on the way for speed, but we haven't done that yet. And so that's it. Um, I'm going to end with our kind of takeaway picture, which is to don't design your programs anymore. Instead, program your designs. That's the idea. Try and make your designs be programmed. And uh, that's it. So thank you. <laughs>